Dear students, it's a pleasure to be able to record this lecture for you on the great St. Anselm of Canterbury. As promised, this lecture is meant to deliver a more complete and um, kind of finished lecture that we were not able to complete when we last met in class. St. Anselm of Canterbury stands as one of the towering figures of the Middle Ages. He was born in 1033 and died in 1109. He became one of the most influential figures uh, while he was alive, uh, though he had some controversies uh, because his writings were contested in different points. However, as we will see when we discuss St. Thomas Aquinas and also St. Bonaventure in the last two classes, uh, the influence of St. Anselm was very much felt for the next 400 years, and of course, we're still discussing him today. His theories and the importance of his thought is of pivotal importance. So let's go and uh, discuss three main works of St. Anselm. Unfortunately, we won't have time to discuss many more, but these three, I think, cover the most important aspects of his teaching. The first one is called the Monologion. The Monologion, again, by its very name, you understand it means a monologue. So in its writing, it's meant to convey already a type of dialectic. It's not simply a static writing, but it's meant to enter into one's, let's say, um, not just imagination, I guess, but appeal to one's uh, kind of thought process, to enter almost into a meditation of uh, the way this argument is laid out. And so in the Monologion, what we see, as we'll discuss in a second, is actually the first building block of what would then be further developed in another one of his writings. And that one is called the Proslogion. The Proslogion meaning dialogue. And it's a dialogue between two who are discussing the possibility of understanding what it means to arrive at a, a, a proof, if you will, for the existence of God. And I'll give you a bit more of the context when we get to that particular writing. And the last writing that we will discuss uh, regarding Anselm of Canterbury is called the Cours Deus Homo, Why God Became Man. It could also be translated in the Latin, if you go more literally, Why, why the God-Man? Why God Became Man, in other words, is you know more... Uh, I guess, fitting translation for us to understand what it means. But he really is asking that question, why a God-man? Of all the things God could have done to save us, of all the things and ways God could have saved us, why through a God-man? So we will spend some time with that one as well. So let's begin. And as we begin, it's important to understand in the first work that we're going to be um, discussing, the monologue, and we're not going to dedicate a whole lot of time to it. As I mentioned, we'll simply discuss it as far as it serves as a building block to his second work, which is the Proslogion. But in the Monologion, it's interesting that the, the work itself, Anselm says, is a, um, not a community effort, but a prompting from the other monks at the Abbey of Beck, which is where Anselm is located when he's writing it. And they're, they're asking him or pressing him to write this work. And it gives, again, a sense that the, the monastic environment uh, in which Anselm is developing his writing and for which or for whom he is writing for. So, again, that's also his audience, his context, these monks. Um, it has a very rich tradition. Already, you could assume, again, the monks are praying with sacred scripture day in and day out. So they know scripture very well. They're praying especially the Psalms. And what's interesting about this is that in the work itself, the monologion, he does not use scripture as a proof text uh, for what he's trying to, to, to say. But actually he considers it, and he later described it as a meditation on divine being. Why a meditation? Because he's really helping one gradually consider in a deeper sense, what exactly it means to understand a, a, a gradual hierarchical ascent, right? We're going up from what is most familiar to us to what becomes perhaps maybe less obvious in our, um, in our experience when we first experience it, 
but it becomes the deepest truth and reality as we meditate on it. And so that's why he's guiding us through what could be called a type of meditation on divine being. And, you know, it's, it's very interesting because this is exactly what he does in his other work, the proslogion. But let, let's just sit a little bit uh, longer with the monologion. In the monologion, Anselm doesn't claim to be able to guide one into an understanding of God's divine being. Why? Because our human minds are too limited to understand God's divine being, his, his very essence. Who is God? The, the, the very being of God, the human mind cannot comprehend. However, one can reach a deeper proximity from understanding what is good to what is this highest good. And he doesn't claim that when one reaches this highest good, one immediately could make that leap and say, okay, we understand the divine being. But we do understand deeper aspects of that divine being. And therefore, this meditation itself is meant to lead one to a deeper reflection on how one is to think about God. And this is precisely the very uh, work of theology. It, it's, a, it's, it's not simply a reading or a commentary on one's opinion of God, but it's a meditation into a deeper understanding and deepening into that. He is famous for um, a statement that he made, and he said, Credo ut intelligam. I believe that I may understand. So we will get into this a little bit more later with the proslogia. So that's as much as we can say about the monologia. Now, if we move on to the proslogion. And the proslogion, again, he makes reference at the very beginning to his community at Beck. And these are these are the, the monks who um, are pressing him to write on this. And uh, he begins um, really in terms of building on something he had already started, which is this almost ascent approach. We had discussed in our class uh, about Pseudo-Dionysius. I, I mentioned to you briefly that Pseudo-Dionysius um, collaborated or contributed, rather, to uh, what later on we'll discuss with St. Thomas Aquinas and also St. Bonaventure in the last two classes, to uh, this, this approach of theology. How, how does one actually do theology? How does theological language develop? And so we had spoken about the three different um, terms or ways that theological language is shaped, and you'll remember this from the class lecture in the notes. But the last one, which was, again, this way of, um, by, by way of superlative, by way of excellence, right, the highest good, we will start seeing here in Anselm where Dionysius' influence, again, already could be seen as connected to Anselm being pivotal for these later thinkers that come after Anselm, after Dionysius. Uh, and of course, the influence of Augustine is ever pervasive. So let's continue. In the Proslogia, written again by um, Anselm, he develops what has come to be called his ontological argument for the existence of God. Again, Anselm did not call it the ontological argument. But later traditions, particularly Immanuel Kant in, um, in, in German uh, philosophy, called it the ontological argument because he argues in terms of God's very existence, God's very being, and he's making a, a, a case for it. Now, I think what's very important uh, once we get to the argument is that we understand he is not saying that this is simply a... Um, a demonstration in the way of proving, for example, that sacred scripture exists, that the Trinity exists, that the mysteries of faith and the deposit of the faith are all true because of this argument. However, he does claim if one understands this foundational argument, one follows it, it's accessible to any person. Any person. And he begins by um, quoting Psalm 14, in which he says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So as, as I guide you through just a breakdown of the proslogion and particularly his ontological argument for the existence of God, what will be important is that you understand again the context, which I think will be very helpful. 
So the question arises very naturally. Was St. Anselm, in fact, trying to convert atheists or agnostics through his argument? The answer is obviously not. And why do I say that? The context, again, for which he is writing is what? A monastery. D does it seem logical to think or assume that the monks don't believe in God, that they've dedicated their lives to celibacy, poverty, and chastity in this, again, remote, location, living together, praying together the scriptures every day, celebrating mass together every day, and that they don't believe in God. So clearly that can't be it. So what is it? What 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 is Anselm trying to do? Well, again, what's very important is that we understand that in the 11th century, Christians and Jews lived in the same towns and coexisted for, again, a, a very long period of time. And this coexistence also prompted sometimes conversions to Christianity. It also prompted questions about, um, for example, uh, Christianity's own intellectual tradition and understanding how uh, God exists or how one understands the relationship between faith and reason. Between what we had spoken about earlier with Augustine, that interaction of the early Christian church with the Greek world or the Greco-Roman world. The Romans were the power, um, the conquering power, but the intellectual philosophical tradition was Greek. And therefore, what we find is that now in the 11th century, and some still shows again the, the meaningful and important relationship between faith and reason for Christian theology. And they go hand in hand. Now, another thing that's important for you to understand as far as the context, even though it's unlikely that Anselm read or had access to Plato's Socratic dialogues, this is, um, again, Socrates who died in the year 399 BC, before Christ. He uh, was, was woven into or written into a series of dialogues so there's a dialectic a aspect on different themes, for example, truth, goodness, piety, justice, um, um, the existence of the gods, for example, or if there's only one God, which Plato and Socrates and that philosophical tradition before Christ, as I've mentioned to you before, already believed uh, that there was only one being, one supreme power. Anyways, there's a similarity between the way that Plato writes these dialogues uh, and he weaves in Socrates and the way that Anselm writes his own writings. It's a dialogue between two people. There's a question and an answer. There's a deepening into the understanding of what the question is. So for Anselm, the question is, does God exist? And so in this proslogion, in this work, he moves the dialect from going into um, the scriptures, which he starts off as a meditation, saying, the fool says in his heart, Psalm 14, right? There is no God. However, when one looks into the question, Anselm doesn't stay with scripture. He says, but what could we say that even the fool would be able to accept as far as a proof, a demonstration, an argument, if you will, that God does exist? And so he leads one from what one already knows into a, a deeper understanding. Again, very similar to what he did in the monologue, on, right? Regarding the good. But here he's talking about God's existence. So... What's essential, again, is that he's not trying to show that through Scripture he's going to quote these different passages and someone who doesn't believe could automatically have faith. He says, what if we start from the perspective that someone doesn't believe, for example, as stated in the Psalms, then if someone doesn't believe, what could we say to help them believe? Now, it's an important context. If one is studying theology, as the monks praying and, and, and doing this work of meditating on the scriptures, meditating on the writings of Augustine especially, and other theologians,